we feel like we're part of this land. We bought in 1872 what is now Osage County. When uh, this land was chosen, they chose it because it was hilly and rocky and nobody would want it. It's a hard story to tell. It started in the 1890s. Oil was discovered during the uh, Great Depression. Nobody had any money except the Osages. It was the wealthiest people in the world. They viewed Osages as being ripe for the picket. The system knew what was happening. The Osages did not. The value of land. The people that did this were your friends, were supposed to be your friends. Although they wore suits and things, they engaged in love skullduggery. All for money and land that wasn't theirs. This story is about a murdering, the one that brought the FBI here. I want people to remember what happened to us. It's been a tough road, but we're still here. Reign of Terror, presented by Osage County Tourism. This land is home to bison and big blue stem, quail and sunflowers. Between the sweeping prairies and rolling hills are flowing streams and blackjack ridges. Underneath this land, oil, a resource that made members of one tribe among the world's wealthiest people. But for years, these hills held a secret, a twisted plot to take that wealth. This land has seen the rise and fall of fortunes and remains home to a resilient, enduring tribe. I'm Tess Monty in Osage County. The story of the Osage murders was made famous through the book Killers of the Flower Moon, now heading to the big screen. But the people you'll see and hear from in this hour are not actors. They're the Osage people telling their story and we begin with the tribe's journey to Oklahoma. With every beat, there's a meaning. And every move, significance. There's a rhythm to it, and if everyone's in sync, it sounds like rain hitting on the ground. And then the drum is the thunder and lightning. And, and then we wear otter hides. We dance and move like the otter, because the otter is quick. You know, life is short, be quick about it. Their traditions the Osage people have protected for centuries, still sacred today. We are a current thriving people that exist here, carrying on our ways, telling our stories and our ways. We're not something of the past. Their story, Osage Nation Language Department Director Braxton Red Eagle says, starts in the sky with the Osage descending from the heavens to earth. Some traditions have it as you know, being brought down by an eagle into the, the treetops of the oak tree. Once they got here, some versions say that the land was covered by water. There's a couple different stories of how that water was cleared and how the land came to be. I guess historically we've had several names tied to us. People know Children of the Middle Waters, Neokonska. That name, he says, is connected to their original homeland. The earliest historical evidence puts the tribe in the Ohio River Valley before they moved on to control a vast territory to live and hunt in what's now Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas, and Oklahoma. But Principal Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear says through a series of land sessions and treaties in the 1800s, the Osage were forced to move to a small strip of land in Kansas, losing not only their land, but also their people. From 1810 to 1890, we lost, some say, 90% uh, of our population mostly through smallpox, measles, and other disease. You can almost say it's a version of genocidal, from 200,000 to 2,000 in 150 years. But they didn't quite understand the power of what we have internally. 
Eddie Red Eagle Jr. is an elder in the tribe and one of only six remaining full blood Osage. Whatever problem we encounter together, then those things are settled. We go into it together. Now multiply that with 200,000 Osages. What have you got? That's the power. That's the strength of the Osage. That strength would carry them out of Kansas when the tribe was forced to move yet again. This time, Chief Standing Bear says they picked their new home in a place where they hoped to get away from the growing U.S. farming industry. They sent the scouts out in different directions with spears and the instructions were if you throw the spear from your horse into the ground and it cannot stand up, it's rocky, that is where we'll go. They ended up in current day Osage County. To ensure they'd never have to move again, in 1872, they bought back close to one and a half million acres of their original territory that the government had given to the Cherokee tribe. They said that when we come in here and we do this and purchase this, this is the last time you're moving us. But the U.S. wanted to move the tribe in a different way, away from its culture. The children were ordered into government boarding schools where they weren't allowed to speak the Osage language, forced to assimilate into white culture. The governance body did not want us practicing these rituals. They wanted us to stop that and go completely with the European approach. But the Osage quietly held on to what they could, while also trying to adapt to a new way of life. When the tribe bought this land, leaders knew oil was here, but it was before the oil boom in the 1920s, so they didn't know how much. Still, in 1906, tribal leaders worked out a deal with the U.S. government to maintain mineral rights, meaning everything under the surface the tribe owns, including oil. When our leaders and our chiefs put that in the Allotment Act, that was meant to be as a foundation for us to provide a financial foundation to survive sort of that tremendous change that happened from 1870 mm -hmm. to 1920. In an agreement between the U.S. government and the Osage, the tribe split the oil profits, giving each of the 2,229 original allottees one share called a head right, along with 640 acres of land scattered across the reservation. But they had no idea beneath the rolling hills and limestone, black gold would soon bring them unimaginable wealth and a sinister plot that would turn a blessing into a curse. the roaring 20s and the oil boom had its grip on Osage County after the largest oil deposit in the U.S. was discovered west of Pahuska. Oil companies were leasing up the mineral rights for millions of dollars, making the Osage people some of the richest in the world. The record of Bureau of Indian Affairs shows uh, in the mid-1920s each Osage man, woman, and child received uh, the equivalent in today's dollars of 400,000 a year, okay. which is a lot of money. I mean, if you had a family of four, that's 1.6 million. They were living the high life, let me tell you. Old films from Meg Jennings family collection shows the Osage walking in two worlds, from traditional Osage dinners to fancy cars and all of the finest things, like fur coats and even flying airplanes, life was good until it wasn't. Life was good when they weren't in Pahuska because they had bodyguards watching their farm. Um, they knew something was up. They knew people were dying and so um, they spent a lot of time away from Oklahoma. With every dollar, 
came envy, greed, and betrayal. People with bad intentions made their way to the Osage, looking for a share of what wasn't theirs. A lot of dirty dealing going on. They viewed Osage as being ripe for the picking. They had money and they wanted it. And in many cases, money was the motive for murder. Another plot was to marry into the tribe and kill off those family members with the, all, all the head right interest goes to one person. Retired Judge Marvin Stepson says his grandfather, William Stepson, was killed for his head right in 1922. William was a champion steer roper, world traveler, and corporal in the U.S. Army. He was just 29 when he went to take a nap and never woke up. They suspect poison whiskey. I suspect it too. I think I know who did it. A guy by the name of Kelsey Morrison was a bootlegger. And he'd been known to deal in poison whiskey, strychnine apparently, for money. Money, what else? He eventually married my grandfather's widow. It's uh, on her tombstone, it says, wife of K.L. K. Morrison. I think she divorced him or tried to divorce him uh, before she died. He probably killed her too, as well. To get my grandfather's son and his stepdaughter, to get them, well, he'd get all their money. He had a plot to kidnap them and take them to Mexico, and they would never return. It didn't happen. In other words, I'm not supposed to be here. Like many Osage deaths at the time, Williams was never investigated. Neither was his widow's, so Morrison was never charged. But he did go to prison for killing someone else in an infamous murder ring that would come to be known as the Reign of Terror. The Reign of Terror, the, the time that we're speaking about, is, is during the 20s, and specifically from 1920 to 1926, when there were so many, so many Osages lost their lives through either, you know, murder or poison or, you know, various other means of, um, I don't know, assault on our, you know, on, on our people um, in, an, in an effort to defraud them, you know, from, from, their, from their money and from their land. Some of the cold-blooded killings made headlines around the world. This is the, one of the actual newspapers from the Daily Oklahoman. It's dated Sunday, January 17th, 1926. Death marches on the Osage trails. But as time marched on, the stories of the murders seemed to be buried with the victims they claimed. That's just one of the things is that it just wasn't talked about, you know. <sighs> Tara Dameron is a member of the Osage Nation and also a historian and the director of the White Hair Memorial near Ralston. It's the former home of an Osage woman named Lily Morell Burkhart. She left um, her state, which is her home here, and her head rights um, to in trust to the Oklahoma Historical Society um, to be used as a shrine to her ancestor, Whitehair, who was one of our Osage chiefs. The home now houses Lily's large collection of Osage clothing, cultural artifacts, historical photos, a library, and some archives from the Reign of Terror. Ruth, give me a cigarette, will you? Like an audio interview from 1971 that's never been shared before. It gives a first-hand account of a house explosion in Fairfax that killed Osage head right holder Rita Smith, along with her husband Bill and their housekeeper. I was there that night. We were living just across the alley. It woke me up. I took me plumb out of bed. You're hearing from the late Fred Kenny, an Osage man who was just a kid in the 1920s when his neighbor's house blew up in the middle of the night. And I got it went up there. Old Bill was alive then, you could hear him hollering. Part of that house was laying on him, mattress was laying on him, and it was on fire, burning. You could hear him hollering and carrying on, and he lived a little while. He was dead, and that cook was in there, she was a white woman. She was dead, she was just burned to a crisp. I seen one of her arms had picked it up about a block from there. That's the only known recording of a witness account to Reign of Terror killings. But there are written versions, and nearly a century later, the real-life crimes became a centerpiece of David Grant's 2017 best-selling book, Killers of the Flower Moon, introducing the world to a story 
that had been forgotten. People need to know this. We need to know this. The world needs to know this. The book, now a Martin Scorsese movie, focuses on the life of Osage original Alati Molly Burkhart, who watched her family members one by one mysteriously die. First, her sister Minnie passed away suddenly from what doctors called a wasting illness when she was just 27. Here we go, June 3rd, 1921. Anna Brown's body has been found. Then her sister Anna was discovered dead from a gunshot wound to the head. It's believed their mother, Lizzie Q, was poisoned a few months later. And not long after that, the explosion killed Molly's sister and brother-in-law, Rita and Bill. In a span of just a few years, Almost her entire family was wiped out. Molly was left with just her son, daughter, and husband, Ernest, along with the massive fortune that once belonged to her family. And the questions, who was next? Who was responsible? And who could be trusted? She wasn't the only one looking over her shoulder. With an apparent killing spree on tribal members running rampant, all Osage families lived with those same fears. Estimates sort of vary of original Lattes. There's, there's over 200 people that died in that time frame. Many would never know the truth about what happened, but for a few, the answers would eventually come. Next, a fledgling federal agency is called in to help. People weren't willing to speak. People were fearful. Will government investigators be what it takes to finally solve the case? When Alex Cameron picks up the story from Washington.